You've taken on the important role of serving as the conservator for another individual, and now it's time to complete your annual account of fiduciary. Hi, I'm Darren Fiddling of The Probate Pro, and I'm going to walk you through step-by-step -step how to work with this annual account of fiduciary form and what the requirements are. Please understand that this is just the beginning, just the basics. I strongly urge you to work with a competent, skilled attorney to ensure that you follow all of Michigan's court rules, statutes, and obligations that you have as a conservator. The conservatorship is the fiduciary role of handling finances, and part of that financial responsibility, of course, is to account. Let's take an in-depth look at the annual account of fiduciary. The first thing we're going to do is understand where this falls within the timeline of serving as a conservator. Now understand that this is already one year from the anniversary date of when you have received your letters of conservatorship. A petition would have been filed, you would have had your court hearing, you would have been appointed already. Now there are two relevant provisions of Michigan law that you should be familiar with. One is MCL 700.5418. It provides that a conservator, at least yearly, should account to the court and to the interested parties for all of the financial affairs of the person they're serving as conservator of. There are some rare occasions where the court may enter an order that allows this to occur biannually or may even waive that requirement, but those are rare and would only occur with a court order. In addition, there's a court rule, MCR 5.409. It sets forth that this accounting period should include the anniversary date of your appointment of conservator one year from there and needs to be filed with the court within 56 days. So you really have a little short of two months after that anniversary date to gather all the requisite material that you have so that you can complete and fill out the annual account of fiduciary. Now, one piece of advice that I urge and encourage anyone who is going to serve as the conservator is don't wait until the year is over, but rather account on a day, week, and monthly basis. Use an accounting software, keep all receipts, copy all bank statements. These are the types of things you're gonna need at the end. And it's awfully difficult at the end of the accounting period to then go and try to gather all of these things. You wouldn't be, you'd be amazed at how often people walk into my office with a box of scrap paper and receipts and unorganized information and ask us to assist them in an accounting. So I strongly encourage you to keep accurate records every step of the way. In addition to a log, so that you are identifying the time associated and what you did. So when you need to reflect on anything that occurred within that accounting period, you can simply refer back to your log to remind you of what took place. And if you're not the type of person that's good at managing finances, or, or you're not the type of person that's good at keeping track of documents and records, you shouldn't be the conservator. You should have somebody else perform that role. Let's now look at the form itself. The form you have here is form PC583. This is a state court administrator approved form that can be used for filing your annual account. Understand that there's also a long form account that you can use if you so choose. The short form is actually pretty user friendly, easy to use. So let's start with this document at the top where the red arrow is pointing, it identifies whether it's an annual account. You can put the annual account number, for example, first, second, third annual account, or if this happens to be the final account, you would check off that box. A final account is when either the individual died or you have been removed as the conservator and a new conservator has been put in place or the conservatorship has been discharged. It's come to an end. That individual can now manage their own financial affairs. An interim account is used when the court requires you to do an accounting that is not based on the year anniversary, but rather is done 
within that year period of time. We call that an interim accounting. At the bottom of the form is some really helpful information. If you look to the right, it identifies the relevant statutes and case uh, court rules that apply to this particular form. This form is also used in deceased probate estates in formal and supervised administrations. So it's a really flexible form that can be used in a variety of contexts. The next part of this form is really simple to fill out. You identify the county in which the probate court is being administered and the case number. Most conservatorships that are adult conservatorships end in the letters CA for adult conservatorship. If it's for a minor, it would be CY. So that's the case number that you'd want to include there. The next section is pretty intuitive to fill out. You, you're going to identify the name of the estate or the person that you're serving as conservator of, your name and that you're the conservator. And then the next part is a little confusing. It reflects the annual dates upon which you're serving the conservator, serving as conservator, or if it's a final account, the end date would be identified. So what do you do? You look at your letters of conservatorship. That would be your beginning date. Then go 12 months from that date. So for example, if you were appointed conservator on January 1st, your accounting period would be January 1st through December 31st. Where it really becomes complicated is if there's a bank account and the bank account statement dates don't align perfectly with your date of appointment. So you want to get bank statements that incorporate that entire period of time. The next section on the left identifies any income or gain or receipts that have been realized. So for example, social security income, pension, a sale of a piece of real estate. That's where income would be reflected. And on the right side, any expenses. This is a listing of all the expenses. It may be groups or it may be individualized. And typically when we do accounts, we provide lots of addendums to this that show each transaction that occurred within that accounting period to fully advise the parties in the court as to the expenses that have occurred. Below that is under total column one and total column two is the totals of both the income and the expenses. On the back side of the form, it's really like a summary of everything that we've identified below and above. So for example, the balance on hand would be a reflection of either what was on the inventory or last year's annual account. The next section is the income from page one, sub a subtotal and then the expenses from page one and then you do your math that number in line 2e should mirror what you show in the next section this is a description of the balance that are in hand at this particular time so the court and the interested parties are going to want to see that what you list in this itemization of assets remaining at the accounting period correlates with your statements. This is no different than reconciling a bank account. It is a description of all of the activity that has occurred and what remains at the end of the accounting period. The next section discusses the court rule as it relates to providing appropriate documentation to support this accounting. And again, as I stated at the beginning, it's critical that you keep incredibly accurate records, precise records, to be able to advise the court and the interested parties as to the events that have occurred during that accounting period. You also have to identify whether there have been any differences in who the interested persons or parties are relating to the annual account. The next area is a description of whether any fiduciary fees are being charged to the estate by the conservator and whether there are any attorney fees and these are stated here with an itemization attached to seek court approval of those expenses and charges that have been incurred during the accounting period in addition there's a checkbox about whether the account is being filed there are some circumstances where an account doesn't need to be filed with the court in the next section i ask that you take pause before signing your name it's the penalty provision of this particular account 
that talks about that you're signing it under the penalties of perjury. So misleading, misstating, committing perjury among the court has a real serious consequence. So before you author your name and sign it to this particular account, make sure that you're providing a true and accurate information to the best of your information, knowledge, and belief before filing it with the probate court. Obviously, this presentation on the step-by-step -step process of completing and filing an annual account is really just the basics. I strongly encourage you to work with competent legal counsel before trying to do this on your own. You can make all sorts of mistakes, and we know that there's a lot of litigation that ensues when people have either failed to file this timely or have misstated or made mistakes on the annual account. You can be surcharged, which means held liable or responsible for the information that are misstated or misconstrued or misrepresented on that annual account. So please hire counsel. If you'd like to discuss annual accounts with my office or any probate related matter, the phone number is below 833-PROBATE. We'd be happy to discuss this matter with you and we hope that this presentation has been helpful.